curiosity, but it's not really something which is very, very prevalent or a major mechanism of nerve system. But there is quite a lot of evidence now that CP transitivity could be quite common in plant communities and could be really important in maintaining their biodiversity. So Santi and I thought it would be interesting to get together some of the main people working on intransitivity and to think about how we can empirically measure the effects of intransitive competition on coexistence. Could you briefly explain what intransitivity is? Yes, okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. That's probably a good place to start. So intransitivity is, intransitive competition is like the rock, paper, scissors game. So it basically means there's no strict hierarchy of competition and your success in competition depends on who you're competing against. You will see lots of diagrams for you to talk to about that, don't worry. <laughs> so yeah, I think we have a, a really great lineup of speakers today. And I'm very much looking forward to hearing what they think about these issues of trying to measure intransitivity, how common it is, and about how to integrate intransitive theory with modern coexistence theory. And with that, I'll hand over to Santi, who's going to introduce the first speaker. Yeah, uh, first of all, I want to thank all of our speakers for coming and accepting the invitation. And well, the first and keynote speaker, this is Stefan Alessina, who will have an extra long talk, uh, 25 minutes. So, I know it's customary to thank the organizers, and, and, but today I have to thank them extra because I accepted this invitation and then realized I had nothing to say. <laughs> so, then I started desperately searching for something to say, and I found something that I think is interesting. So, that's what I'm going to show you uh, today. And besides thanking the organizer, I want also to thank my co-authors. And there is a manuscript that is in review right now, and I'm happy to share it with you. And then the funding agencies. And so like today, my goal is to present a theory that has some uh, nice characteristics. Uh, one of them is that it allows for the stable coexistence of an arbitrary number of species. And it does so because of higher order interactions which have been debated in ecology for decades. John here was writing about them in 1969, <laughs> but now they're back in fashion. And this theory can produce any species abundant distribution, and it's highly robust to changes in parameters, which I find interesting. And just to get started, I would like to consider this picture of the Amazon rainforest. And there's like two things that I would like to say. One is that you can hardly fit any more trees than there are, right? Unless you can grow them on water. And the second thing that it's more difficult to see from this picture is that this is a highly diverse system, right? If we were to draw a 100 by 100 meter plot, we would find more than 200 species of trees coexisting in this forest. And so like being a theoretician, I want just to have a cartoon of this. So there's a number of trees. It's packed, right, with trees. And they all are of different species, identified by the colors. And at some point, one of these uh, uh, tree here, like this purple tree, dies, right? And this opens a gap in the canopy. And therefore, like the seeds in the seed bank start germinating and competing. And eventually, one of the seedlings will grow faster than the rest and fill the gap, right? At the end of the process, we ended up with the same exact number of trees that we started from. And so this is what it's called a zero sum. Uh, dynamics. And so because we, we have a fixed number of trees, what I'm going to do is to track the proportion of trees of each species, and I will call these x of i, such that their sum is 1. And then we need to define three main processes. The first process is death, right? So each species will have a death rate, d of i or d of j, and you can think of this as the inverse of the average lifespan of these trees, okay? And so when we have a certain proportion of trees, this is the proportion of trees that will die in a certain time step will be the product of these two numbers. The second process that we need to define is, of course, birth, right? So we could think that each a tree has a certain fertility, right? It produces a certain number of seeds that will germinate or not. So let's say the f of i is the, the number of seedlings produced by a tree of species i, right? And this could be different from another tree of species j. And so like when we're picking a, a seed, imagine that I take all the seeds in the forest, put them in a bag, and then I extract one. 
then the probability will be proportional to this f of i times the proportion of trees of species i, x of i. So that's birth, and the last thing that I want to introduce is like an interaction between the species. So imagine that we pick two seedlings of two different species, i and j, and we put them next to each other and they have to fill this gap in the canopy. Which one will win the competition? I will call the probability that i wins the competition against j, hij, and of course, the opposite is going to be hji, and their sum must be one, right? One of the two will eventually win and fill the gap, right? So you could think of this as a matrix of probabilities of winning against each other. And so, like, this is my hij, and that is defined as one minus hji. Thank you very much. Okay. So I said that this th theory relies on higher order interactions, but I'm going to start with pairs. So I'm going to say, let's play a game in which we have a forest. Every time a tree dies, I take all the seeds and then pick two at random, plant them there, and see who wins, right? So, so we compete the first seedling with the second seedling, and the winner fills the gap, right? And then if I take uh, this type of framework, I can derive very many different models. And so some limiting cases, for example, are when all the interactions are the same, one half, right? So I flip a coin to decide who wins the competition, and all the physiological rates, f of i and d of i, are identical. Then I recover a neutral model in the spirit of Hubble and other uh, neutral models. At the opposite end, I have still same physiological rates, just for simplicity, but now I have that there is complete dominance between seedlings. So when I have two species, i and j, one either always wins or always loses against the other. Then I, I can think of this matrix H as depicting a graph, a special type of graph that is called a tournament. And this is what I studied with Jonathan Levine in 2011. And I'm going to have a, an example of that. Of course, you can generalize this to saying, and I can choose any probability of winning, HIJ, HJI, in which case we would talk about a hyper tournament. You can think of a generalization of a tournament. And I'm going to concentrate most of my talk on this case. Identical physiological rate, such that I can compare with neutral theory or tournaments, but arbitrary uh, com competitive ability that ranges from neutral to complete dominance. And then, of course, I can generalize this further by taking you know, different for, uh, fertilities and different death rates for all the species. And I'm going to do this at the end. So if I take the limit of like very many individuals such that I can forget about stochastic effects, I can write a deterministic model for, for these type of things in which I pick two seeds and one wins. And the equation would look like this. These are a bit difficult to, to, to see. So I'm going to just give you an example of a rock, paper, and scissor. So imagine that we have only three species and they form a rock, paper, and scissors such that there's no competitive dominant. The matrix H would look like this, right? We have one half on the diagonal because the probability of winning against themselves is flip of a coin. And then we have ones and zeros off diagonal, right? And then the equation would simplify to this type of thing. Here is a death term, like the probability that a tree of species rock dies or species paper dies or species scissor dies here. And then this is the probability that I pick two seedlings of species rock, in which case rock will surely fill the gap. And here is the probability of getting a rock and a scissor, and I can do this in two ways. And also here, the rock will fill the gap. OK? So these are the equations. What is interesting about these equations is they can write them in a completely different way. That becomes a replicator equation, which is a type of equation that has been studied a lot in evolutionary game theory. And the replicator equation looks simpler. And you see that now we have a matrix P instead of having our matrix H. And this matrix P that are payoffs is H minus the transpose of H. So it's the difference between the probability of winning and the probability of losing. And, and so this depicts like a game between two players that play with a zero-sum game. Like if you win $1, I, I lose $1, such that the amount of dollars that are lost or won is the same, and it's constant. And this is basically what we studied with Jonathan in 2011. So this is how the matrix P would look like for rock, paper, and scissors. Right now we have plus ones and minus ones, and we have zero on the diagonal. And here are the equations. What is interesting is that equations that looks very different from the preceding one are, in fact, the same type of equations. And you can do very simple algebraic manipulation to show that these two systems of equations are exactly the same, which means that I can find results with one set of equations and apply them directly to the other one, and vice versa. So, so it's very convenient. 
So what about the dynamics of this thing? So, so if I play this game, what happens to the species in the forest? So if we take a rock, paper, and scissor, and we start from any positive initial condition, what we see is that these species will oscillate up and down, and they will oscillate about one equilibrium that is one-third density of each, which is like a, the only fixed point in the interior of this simplex. And so basically, I can start one-third each, they will stay flat, and as soon as I move a little bit, they will start oscillating, and these cycles are neutral. So if I move it a little further away, they will oscillate with larger amplitudes. And the same happens in the more complicated case of like having hyper tournaments where I have probabilities of winning that you know, are depicted by these gray arrows here. So for any system I can come up with, starting with, say, five species, a certain number will go extinct, and these will go extinct irrespective of initial conditions, so they always end up being filtered out. And those that coexist, this tree, for example, will uh, persist through these uh, neutral cycles. So they will cycle up and down. And the same happens in more complicated cases. Here I have five species coexisting through these neutral cycles. And I can even have the strange case of four species uh, cycling up and down. And I say this is a special case. Why? Let's imagine that we build these tournaments or hyper tournaments, like these matrices at random. Right? So I can build a tournament at random by saying for each pair, I flip a coin and I decide the direction of the arrow by looking at the direction, uh, either head or tail. Right? So this would be this case here. For a hyper tournament, I say for each pair, I draw a random number between 0 and 1, and I set hij to that number z and hji to 1 minus z. Okay, so then, now I can build a, a tournament or a hyper tournament as large as I want. And let's say that I start with the S species. Then I let the dynamics unfold, wait for long enough, and I end up with K species coexisting. What is the probability that if I start with S species, I end up with K? And amazingly, you can do this analytically and show that the probability is zero if K is even, and if K is odd, is S choose K, two to the one minus S. And this is true both for tournaments and for hyper tournaments, as shown, for example, in simulations here, right? So the probability of getting an even number to coexist, uh, species to coexist at random, is zero, which is what mathematician would say. Like, there's infinitely many ways to do that, right? But they have measure zero, so so they're infinitely rare, also. Okay, so that's why having an even number of species in this setting is very special. It requires some fine tuning. So so when we're doing this, we're implicitly fine tuning the parameters to make this happen, and fine tuning in biology don't go well together, so I don't believe in fine-tuning. All right, what about the type of species abundance distribution that can this model uh, create? Turns out that if you give me any species abundance distribution X star that you like, I can build infinitely many systems that have that as an equilibrium. So this theory can produce any species abundance distribution that you like, of course with the caveat that if you want to have an even number of species coexisting, be assured that there's some fine tuning such that if I change the coefficients in H even of a little bit, some of them will go extinct. Okay. Right, so just to summarize this first model, for any matrix with S species, we have that a certain number of species will go extinct irrespective of in initial conditions. The other one will coexist irrespective of initial conditions. And those that will coexist will cycle neutrally about a single equilibrium point, X star, that we can choose arbitrarily. So we can, we can match our, say, data if we want. All right, this is what I want to say for two seedlings at a time, and now I want to extend it to three seedlings at a time. So imagine that we have a gap in the forest, and there's three seedlings competing. Two are kind of closer to each other in space, so these two will, will compete first, and then the winner will compete against the third, and then the winner of the second bout will fill the gap, right? So we have a chain of uh, a competitive bouts. Okay, and I'll try to put like a li little icon of three over here such that you don't get confused if we're talking about two or three. So you can do the same that I did before. You can write down all the possible ways of having three seedlings of species i, j, and k, and, and write down differential equations that they would look like this. As before, I think this is easier to see looking at uh, rock, paper, and scissor. So as before, like we have our matrix H, which is the same as we had before. We have our death terms here that are the same as before, but now we have to account for sampling three seedlings, right? So this is the probability that we pick three 
seedlings of a species rock, right, and then rock will win. There's three ways of picking two rocks and one scissor. There's three ways to pick one rock and two scissors. And of the six ways that you can pick in order rock, paper, and scissor, two of them will lead to the winning of rock, right? So, so the equations are like this. As before, we can simplify this and write it as a replicator equation, right? So, so I can write this, and now instead of having a matrix of payoffs, I have a tensor of payoff, a three-dimensional uh, matrix in which I can write pijk as a function of the pairwise interaction. So this is very special, right? It's not any uh, payoff tensor. It's a very peculiar one, right, where, where I basically build it based on pairwise information. And you can think of this as three players playing rock, paper, and scissor at the same time, right? Before we had the two-player game, now we have a three-player game. But we will see many of the results don't really change. Just to give you an example of this payoff tensor, like now we have to slice the tensor into three slices. So there's, these are the three slices, and these are the payoff of, say, player one that plays rock, when, for example, player two plays also rock, and player three plays uh, paper. Right? And these are the equations. And as before, you can show that these two different ways of writing the, the model are, in fact, equivalent. And as such, I can translate the results of one into the other, and vice versa. What about the dynamics? Right? Before, we had these uh, neutral oscillations. And now, magically, they're gone. Right? So, so, so what happens is that allowing for three species at a time to compete for uh, filling a gap moves the system, the dynamics, from neutral oscillations to global stability. So wherever I start the system of rock, paper, and scissor, I will always end up at the equilibrium. And this is globally attractive. And this happens also for the other cases. So here we had the two species that went extinct, and the other one now equilibrates. And the same happens when we have five, or any number, really, and also when we have four though this is a special case. Again, if I were to tweak the parameters a little bit, some of them will go extinct. What happens to the equilibrium? If we have this uh, very special case in which all the physiological rates are the same, the equilibrium does not change. Like, we have the same equilibrium when we sample two seedlings at a time, three seedlings at a time, 15 seedlings at a time. It doesn't matter. It's the same equilibrium. It just goes from being neutrally stable in the case of two to globally attractive in the case of more than two. So just to summarize the second model, where we pick three seedlings at a time, we start with a certain matrix H on H, uh, S species. Some of them will go extinct, irrespective of initial conditions. Those that uh, coexist, however, now do so stably at an equilibrium point X star that is globally stable. Uh, and globally stable provided some very mild conditions, which I'm not going to talk about, that only happen when we have an even number of species. And the good point is we can choose x arbitrarily. So, so we can take any species abundance distribution that we like, build a matrix, or in fact, infinitely many matrices, if you will, that lead to this uh, being the global attracting state for the system. OK, now you said two, three. What about four, five, six, seven, eight? You know, like we can say, well, we can generalize this. We have a certain number of seedlings that we pick to fill the gap k. And then we compete the first with the second, whoever wins with the third, whoever wins with the fourth, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and eventually we pick a winner, right? So what happens is not very much, right? When we pick three seedlings, this system equilibrates at about 300 time steps. When I pick four seedlings, it just goes faster. It equilibrates at about 200 time steps. And when I pick five, at about 100. So, so we go to the same exact equilibrium, we just go there faster. OK, but now, this is all very well. But what happens when we pick different physiological rates, right? So all species are different to some extent. And we cannot really fine tune the death rates to be exactly the same for all trees. So what happens if we let these fertilities, right? So the number of seedlings produced by each species or the death rate, like the average lifespan of trees, to vary. And something quite interesting happens. So in the case of picking two seedlings at a time, where we had neutral stability, now we have global instability. So there is still this equilibrium point, but it's globally unstable. And you can see this because you can see that these cycles are slowly but steadily moving away from the equilibrium point when we perturb 
these uh, growth rates, like these fertilities and death rates, right? And what I did here is I just started from the same exact initial condition, but chose the F of i's and D of i's uniformly between 0.9 and 1.1, so a small deviation from being all identical at one, right? And, and this you can prove that it's always going to be unstable. It will move to like the outer uh, cycle in the simplex, a heteroclinic cycle, and eventually we will have monodominance. So when we perturb the two uh, seedlings case, we have global instability. And the same happens for all cases. So you can see also here that these cycles are growing in amplitude. Here they're growing in amplitude, and here the same, right? And in fact, here, because we had this very special case, we would have also to fine tune the fertilities and death rates to keep having four species. Otherwise, one of them will go extinct immediately, right? And that's what I was saying, that this is not very robust, this even number of species. But what happens when we have more than uh, two seedlings at a time is that this is very robust. It's very hard to prove that this is the globally stable, but it's at least locally stable. And the simulation show you that you get results like this. You know, like these were at an equilibrium that was one third each before. Now we change the parameters so the equilibrium is not one third, one third, one third as it was before. But still, we have complete uh, attractivity of this thing. Here is the same, here is the same, and here is the same. Besides the fact that this one goes extinct. All right. So this brings me to some conclusions. The first one, I think it's an interesting distinction that was held in the literature in ecology for a very long time, and it's the difference between interaction chains and higher order interactions proper, right? So, so in, uh, an interaction chain, you could think of like a sequential number of steps, thank you, uh, uh, in which we have a bout of competition, and then we have another one, and then we have another one, right? Uh, so like intransitive competition is always seen as something that operates thanks to these indirect uh, effects that are uh, apparent through these chains of interactions. And higher order interactions, you could think of them as like the abundance of one species modifies the way other two species, for example, interact with each other, right? Here, because we have a, a separation of time scales, right? The, the, the time it takes to, for a tree to die, like the lifespan of a tree is much, much longer than the time it takes for filling the gap. And as such, we have that these two things that are not distinct anymore, and they're kind of blurred in the same a, a concept, right? So, so, so we have that these are actually higher order interactions. These things stop working. But you can see here, there's like a triplet of abundance is multiplying each other, which is the, the signature of a higher order uh, term. A, and this, we can write it in two different ways, like either a sequence of competition bouts or higher order interactions, and we get exactly the same model. But this is because nothing can intervene in the time we're doing this sequence of interactions. Things cannot die in the meantime. And, and this is like an example of, of this phenomenon, but you could think of very many other examples. Imagine, for example, that we have a food web. Right? And there's some herbivore consuming a primary resource and then being consumed by a predator. If the, the herbivore dies and is eaten by the predator before it can reproduce, it basically linked automatically the resource to the predator in a higher order term. So, so like these type of mechanisms could be fairly general. So that's point number one. The second point is more empirical, uh, and it's the following. If I want to parameterize empirically pairs of interactions, and I have n species, I have n choose two pairs, so it's basically n squared divided by two uh, numbers that I have to find, right? And it's hard. If I want to parameterize triplets, right, then how many triplets do I have? n choose three, which is basically n cubed divided by six, which is a much, much larger number. So you can think that empirically, you would need an incredible number of experiments to be able to parse out all these higher order terms. And when you go to quadruplets or, or higher order even, it gets also more complicated, right? So the good thing about this theory is that we don't really need to measure anything in terms of triplets, right? All the, the parameters follow naturally from pairwise interaction. So if I have my pairwise, I can write down my tensor as a function of the pairwise interactions. And these could be, for example, parameterized empirically. And what about intransitivity? This is like a talk on intransitivity, supposedly. So I wanted to mention this fact. And so I don't know if I mentioned this, but like when we have this tournament 
game, right? We can have coexistence of species only if we have an intransitive cycle spanning all of them, right? So imagine the rock, paper, and scissors being a good example. Here, when we allow like this uh, uh, probability of winning to vary, like this matrix H, we have that we need to have intransitivity at least in probability, right? That the probability of Imagine I coarse grain this matrix H by taking as one whatever is greater than 50% and zero whatever is lower than 50%, I would recover something that is intransitive, at least in the case where I have identical physiological rates. When I allow, allow these physiological rates, death terms, and fertilities to vary, then I can still have coexistence of a perfectly transitive system because I can choose these other parameters such that they still coexist, right? So, so it's much more general. Like the, the, the model when we have different fertilities and death rates is as complicated, if not more complicated, than, than Lotka Volterra. And finally, I just wanted to summarize, like my goal was to present you this theory, and this theory is a theory that relies on higher order interactions. Like they're a key ingredient, it's not something that I've added. It's something that is fundamental for the coexistence of species in this theory. And it has some nice properties. I said, like, uh, we can have an arbitrary number of species coexisting, so we can totally have like, a system which there's 200 species of trees per hectare and can produce any species abundant distribution, which also tells you that like, uh, when we're trying to parse out, say, neutrality versus niche using like, a static picture like species abundant distribution, I don't think there is hope to do that because like the static picture, I can produce infinitely many models and I cannot distinguish among them by just looking at the static picture. We really need the dynamics. And, but anyway, you can produce any species of distribution and what is most important is that it's very resistant to changes in parameters. So small modifications in parameters, they do not like make the system burst into flames as, for example, would happen in a neutral model. Imagine you have a neutral model, and now a species has a slightly higher growth rate, it will take over the world. Here, not. And what I think it's promising is that we can find these parameters empirically, because basically we only need to measure like fertility rates, death rates, and pairwise interactions. And with that, I'm happy to take any question. Thank you. John? Uh, uh, just re relative to your last conclusion there, uh, which I'm sympathetic with because I long not thought that, long thought that these abundance distributions don't tell us very much. However, you've kind of changed my mind in the opposite direction now, and you're saying that you did anything, but isn't it then really remarkable that all of these big, big forest plots that we have and everything, they have distributions that are all relatively similar. Distinguishing between log normal and Hubble is very difficult, I agree. However, they all have basically the same shape. How, how can that happen? Right. Yeah, that's, that's a very good uh, question. I think that maybe for that you would need to think of something like stochastic. Then, then you would probably have uh, that these things are favored. Like when you start sampling, like of course, things that are very abundant are gonna be there and then you have like uh, immigration of rare species and, and then you get something that looks like a log normal. Yeah, yeah, but that's a good point. Axel. Yeah, it's equivalent to Lotka Volterra. It's a replicator equation. Right. Yes. Right. So each replicator equation of the kind that I showed you when we have two species interacting, like this one here, this. Okay, so this is like a system with n species. You can transform this with an algorithm into n minus one Lotka Volterra. Well, I mean, you can also do the backwards. Like you can take any Lotka Volterra n of n species and transform it into n plus one replicator equation of this kind. No, no, they, they look exactly like generalized Lotka Volterra. Oh, they could share. <laughs> Define funny, I'm not sure. Yeah, but so, so that's what it is. Like I think if you had Lotka Volterra, imagine that now I have a constant like growth rate 
you would find very much the same results. Like for, say, competitive Lodka Volta with, with all the same growth rates. If you change the growth rates, then you end up with a system that looks very much like the one that I show you when you have different growth and death rates. All right, well, I think we probably better move on, but thank you very much again. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much, Eric and Santi, for the invitation. For me, it has been great fun to do this, this, this work. I, I learn a lot. I also collaborate with new people. So, well, this is not working, but anyway. And so, thanks again. So, so I will move for a rather theoretical um, work to a rather experimental work. And um, the, the, the main motivation of this work is because we've been working with phylogenies and functional traits to try to understand model coexistence theory and these different drivers. And after doing that, we were really interested in what happened when you put a model coexistence theory into a multi-species framework. Because actually, what we know is that many of the systems are rich species systems, and the Cheson framework somehow is limited because it only takes into account species as being pairs or being two different groups. So before I move to a multivariate system, a multi-species system, I would like to briefly remind what Cheson thinks about how coexistence works, and you have two kinds of species differences, which are niche differences, and you have also fitness differences. A niche difference in Cheson framework stabilizes coexistence by making interspecific competition higher than interspecific competition, and, uh, fi and fitness differences do not promote coexistence, it tends to promote competitive exclusion. And in the absence of, of niche differences, it determines who wins. So actually, the, the cool thing about Cheson framework is that you have a region for exclusion and a region for coexistence that depends on how species are, are, are along this, this system, and two, you can have two species that coexist, differences overcome large fitness differences, or you can have also coexistence because small niche differences overcome small fitness differences. Okay, so we have for a pair, when you draw a narrow for one species to another, you have not one or zero that we have seen with simulations, you have a component of niche differences and a component of fitness differences. But what happens when you go for a th the simplest case of a, of a three species system? And as Laurie said before, you may have a species arranged in a transitive competition or in transitive. In transitive competition, you have coexistence because the species have shared enemies. So if you will have B and C, there will be no coexistence. But because of the presence of A that harms more preferentially B than C, you have the three species coexisting. And for the case of the intransitive loop, you have, as we explained, the rock, people, the rock uh, scissors paper game. So, so when you have, for instance, as the experiment we have, 18 different species, one of the first questions to, if you want to try to understand how important our intransitive and transitive competition for species coexistence is how prevalent it is. How, usually how prevalent is transitive competition and intransitive competition in natural systems? Because we have no idea at all. Um, and we have a random expectation that at least the 25% of all triplets will be intransitive. And it's very easy to understand. If you have a species pair, the chance of, as, as Stefano said, the chance to win one species or another is a half. And then the chance for this half to be in one different direction or in another is half of the half. And this is why you have the 25%. Another important thing is that nobody has before teased apart the different effects of pairwise niche differences for these new configurations when the species are in triplets, right? So you can have. Uh, the effect of, of, of the intransitive loop, for instance, to promote coexistence. But you know also, and uh, there is work showing that, that you have pairwise niche differences also stabilize the coexistence at the same time. So another important question is, which is the relative importance of these intransitive loops compared to the pairwise niche differences that the species may have and stabilize also coexistence? So for doing that, uh, we conduct an experiment long time ago, or at, at least to me seems a long time ago, in, in California, in an unobserved grassland. 
where we have 18 different species that they were from disparate clades, which allow us to have also very different uh, functional traits. Uh, also, in the work I'm presenting here today, there is a component of functional traits and how the implication of, of this intransitive loop for the assemblage of a species in multidimensional traits that I'm not going to explain here today, but I will be happy to, to chat with you if later you are interested. But anyway, the, the thing is that we have very closely related species with very similar traits, like these two species on the top of Agoceris, or this species and this is another species of Lotus, but also we have very different weird stuff as well. And what we did, as Stefano said, that we need to do is, is for each pair of species having a focal individual of one species that can be blue or can be red, competing against another individuals of the same species or, or the other species. So we can have for each uh, pair of species the four interaction coefficients. So we have the, both the interspecific effects of each species and also the interspecific effects on one species over the another. And we did that uh, putting focal individuals of each species across a density gradient of densities of neighbors. So we were measuring this response to competition at the scene production against the number of neighbors in the community. We also measure, as Stefano said, many other vital rates, such as uh, germination rates and scene survival in the soil that accounts for the, uh, uh, for the soil bank effect. And then we put all in an annual plan model that is basically two terms, the seed bank here in the left and the per capita seed production. And the F accounts for over here, that accounts for how much seeds you can produce in the absence of competition and how this potential for reproduction is a, is a homer by the this term, which means the intra and interspecific competitive effects. We also measure niche overlap for the annual plot model that Chesson defined for the local voltage model as the square root term of the interspecific inter effects divided by the intraspecific effects. And we have shown in a previous paper that for the annual plot model is just exactly the same. And we measure niche difference as one minus rho, which is the niche overlap defined by Chesson. We also measure fitness differences that basically is two components. One is a demographic response, is how much seeds do you produce in general, which gives you competitive dominance, but also how well you respond to competition. So it can give you another way to be a competitive dominant. And we did many different tricks as well that I'm gonna show you in these two slides. So to know the effect of how well intransitive competition stabilizes consistency without pair, pairwise niche differences, we need to maintain the structure of the fitness differences, but we need to put all, fin all niche differences between, so we need to maintain the structure of fitness difference, sorry, but we need to remove all niche differences between pairs of species. And to do that, the paper by Chu Adar, uh, 2015, said that, that we can do that by multiplying the interspecific coefficients by the inverse of niche overlap. Okay. We also, to know whether the triplets that so coexistence are feasible and stable, I'm not going to go through that, but we use linear algebra and we do also obtain the Jacobian matrix of our annual plan model. And we test whether the values are below or above one because our model is discrete. And these are the results. So what we obtain, the first question, if you remember, is how prevalent is intransitive competition? So for our system, uh, regardless whether you measure transitive and intransitive, loop, uh, uh, transitive and intransitive loops Consider whether there are fitness differences, whether there are considering equilibrium abundances, or whether there are considering only triplets without pairs that already coexist. In the three cases, always is the same. You have less uh, number of intransitive triplets that are expected by chance. Always less. Which means that for our system in general, uh, we observe more transitive dynamics than intransitive dynamics. For the more than 2,500,000 uh, assemblies, that is all the combinations of, of 18 different species from 3, 4, 5, up to 18, we only observe 13 feasible assemblage. Most of them are transitive triplets, that are this one over here. Others are in, in transitive triplets, and we have also some feasible quadruplets. There are many interesting points here. One is that although you observe more transitive triplets than intransitive triplets, they are 
t taking into account that the prevalence of transit TTPs in our system is higher, then th it's not, there are not significant differences between the feasible triplets that we observe of transitive and intransitive. Another interesting result is that for those feasible triplets, this is, um, this, this arrow uh, makes the strength of the fitness differences, and the number uh, makes also uh, the number of the, of the niche differences that can go from zero to one. And what we observe is that for those feasible triplets that, for instance, A, one in the left, that they have from MIPO to uh, Agroservice, they have strong fitness differences. For this triplet to be feasible, you need to have high niche differences to counteract the negative effect of fitness differences in promoting competitive exclusion. But for instance, if your fitness difference between the species is very low, like from here to here, you don't need niche difference at all to still maintain feasible, feasible triplets. So I think it's very important, but what he's saying is that Niche differences is acting as a buffer against fitness differences when you have triplets or quadruplets and so on. And that's very important for the following result I'm going to show to you. Another important result is that of these 10 triplets, only three of them were stable. And none of them were intransitive. Most, all of them were transitive. So it's another evidence that for our system, intransitive competition is not prevalent and it's not very important from promoting coexistence. And what I think is most important at all is when, when you remove the niche differences doing uh, the methodology I saw before, none of the triplets and quadruplets in our system so positive, uh, so feasible and stable equilibrium abundances. So what he's saying is that, okay, transitive and intransitive competition can promote coexistence, but actually it's pairwise niche differences who is underlying the coexistence that we are, may observe in multiple species assemblages. So you may think that only three out of more than 2,500,000 uh, assemblage, it's kind of like weird, like why we have so low degree of coexistence. And actually, if we randomize the interaction matrix, this number of three triplex showing coexistence is, 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 is more or less what we will expect by chance. So I, I think I said all the conclusions, but I say transitive in, in transitive competition in our system was infrequent and failed to promote coexistence without niche differences. I think this is important. And uh, I think the low degree of coexistence we observe is rather to the parameters of how species compete in nature rather than the model. So actually nature is, for our, at least for our system, is re really transitive and, and follows a competitive hierarchy. There is a lot of limitations that I can discuss later, whether uh, whether uh, we need to, to take into account high order effects, whether our approach is phenomenological, whether also our approach is taking into account only a single location, a single year, so if you have more limiting factors, m you may encounter more intransitive competition. And to, to end, I would like to, to, be very, to give my thanks to Daniel, Nathan, and Jonathan, who are also part of this project, and also all the funders. Thanks very much. of the model with this experiment. But in, in the nature we observe, well, you have variation and we put the 18 different species come from different locations of the reserve, but we put all in a single location. And up of the 18, 10 of them were in this location. And you can find that not the 10 growing together in the same spot, but in like a few meters from here to there, you can observe the 10 species. Yeah, thank you.
an adjacent mm -hmm. matrix where you have one and zeros. So an arrow can go in one direction or another. And if you if you do that, the probability of having a, a intransitive triplet for three species is 25%. Yeah, but, but the point is, uh, you're assuming that the 50% of the variety of other given species in, in removing or outcompeting the other. Correct. Well, it's taking into account the thickness and the niche difference, it's just a competitive outcome. Who wins the game? Who is it's the same as the second one. So in the in the first five. Yep. Yeah. Uh, I think it's kind of interesting that you get so few intensive triplets. Um, way way fewer than you expect. Yeah. Does that say something about long term dynamics? I mean I think that so. should have I think I, I completely I, I think this is a key point. So so we we found that because we were only in a single location with a Year. And I think for intransitive uh, conditions to arise, you need long-term dynamics, where you have situations in the environment that create winners and losers through time, and uh, or special different locations. Where Actually, that's not what I meant. What I meant was mm -hmm. it seems to me yeah. that uh, what's happening here is that you're excluding a lot of the intransitive loops through the natural process, which suggests that intransitive loops in your system tend to be unstable. Whatever intransitive loops that should have been there are no longer there because they've been excluded in the past through the process of instability. Um, yeah, no. What? <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I mean, if you have the intensity loop that, if I understood correctly, is because uh, this intensity loop operates through longer time series? No. No, that's not what I meant. What are really interesting in that you get so few, yeah. fewer, fewer than you expect. Yeah. That suggests to me that what's been happening in the past, in the past ecological times in the past, not evolutionary time, but yeah. ecological time in the past, those intransitive loops that perhaps were there simply aren't, aren't observable now because they've been excluded. One species has been included, excluded, which yeah. suggests that the intransitive loops tend to be unstable as opposed to stable. Yeah, I, no, I agree, I agree with that, but, but the bottom line I think about that is not just the, that the intransitive loop is no longer working, it's that you need a pairwise niche differences for the intransitive loop to operate, right? Because if not, unless the species are equal competitors, the, 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 the intransitive loop will not work. Yeah. Thank you. Sir, no, it should come up. All right, uh, thanks very much, uh, Santi and Eric, uh, for inviting uh, me. I started thinking about uh, intransitivity about 15 years ago because every time I went to talk to my master's supervisor, he had a big uh, diagram like this up on uh, up on his door, uh, highlighting uh, well some estimated intransitive uh, genotypic relationships. This was uh, Lonnie Arson who studied this for a while uh, at the genotypic level, and uh, it always piqued my curiosity, and and that led to some interesting discussions in the lab, and 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 uh, we've kind of been uh, I've kind of been toying with uh, this work a little bit ever since. Uh, it's really nice to see, though, that uh, that there's sir, the the field is opening up, and there's getting, and it's obvious that lots of interesting uh, work is is continuing in there. So, uh, what I'm going to talk about, the title is slightly uh, uh, different than uh, in the abstract or in the um, in the posting, and that's simply because once we started, we realized that that it was worth expanding the nature of the question a little bit uh, beyond. So, I'll explain exactly uh, what that means. Um, a fairly standard uh, introduction here. Most people recognize intransitive competition uh, as a, you know, exemplified by the simple three, uh, three uh, strategy game, paper, rock, scissors. But you can, and, and this is important, you can expand this out into more dynamic or, or more widespread systems and, and uh, you know, even popularized by, by uh, the five species system uh, or five, uh, five uh, strategy system, paper, uh, scissors, rock, lizard, Spock. 
up there. All right, so, uh, and, and of course, this expands greatly. The more species you include, the, the more possible uh, networked uh, interactions that you can have. Um, and once you start looking at this, and this is the typical way that intransitive uh, tournaments are, are, are considered, at least the, in, uh, this is the way I've learned about them over time. So you can have uh, a tournament graph like this where the arrows point from a subordinate to a dominant, although sometimes it ports, uh, points from the dominant to subordinate. Um, and you can also convert this into a matrix. And as you've seen so far, these matrices can be binary. They can uh, uh, illustrate uh, wins and losses in a fairly simplified form, or they can be, you know, probably more realistic as a probabilistic uh, version of this, uh, in which the probability of replacement of a subordinate by a dominant would be, you know, maybe 30% instead of uh, 100%. Anyway, when you start to consider larger tournaments, uh, it becomes a, a bit of a tr problem, all right? Uh, as you can quickly see, um, the number of possible unique topologies or tournament structures um, explodes as you go up, uh, right? And 17 is, you know, there's a reason why 17 is the, the highest one uh, listed here, and that's simply because no one knows what, what the number is for 18, right? So um, that illustrates one of the problems. So. What you see a lot with uh, the theoretical work on intransitivity are people sampling uh, these different possibilities or trying to assess the biological relevant uh, components of variation in these topologies. Now, some of the work that uh, I did with Rob Laird a few years ago looked at this in a fairly simplified manner. We looked at all tournaments possible for five species sets, and all the tournaments are illustrated on the right there. And then we used a simulation model uh, in which these species competed. And you can see that the, um, a simple measure of coexistence, which was final species richness in, in a spatial model after 500 generations, uh, resulted in some different um, different patterns of, of coexistence. And what's interesting about that is that this uh, coexistence is not actually adequately uh, covered by existing metrics of intransitivity, which means uh, there's something about, uh, about these topologies that is more than uh, what we know about intransitivity that matters for coexistence. But when we looked at this, there weren't enough, there were, there's not enough variation to dig into this. So what we decided to do uh, for this, uh, this work is to dig in a little bit more completely. Now, just to, to illustrate this, um, these are a few of the indices of intransitivity. Now you can, uh, it took a while for us to find all these uh, simply because intransitivity actually uh, is common in other literatures, you know, from, uh, from physics to uh, social sciences um, to a variety of places and to graph theory. So there may, other, there may be other metrics out there, in fact, that we don't know about for measuring or uh, assessing intransitivity. But what you can see here, the, worth, the worthwhile take-home point is that there are different metrics. Uh, they're not 100% correlated, um, but they don't all uh, perfectly predict uh, the final richness estimated for that. And this is in a spatial, uh, uh, a spatial um, uh, co uh, competition uh, tournament. So from there, the previous work suggests that uh, current indices of intransitivity or measures of intransitivity in large systems um, don't fully explain intransitivity-related coexistence. Uh, so look, we decided to look at this for larger tournaments, uh, for six to eight species, well, and also for a random sample of the possible ones for nine species, because as you saw from that, uh, that uh, um, uh, uh, table earlier, that there's a very large number of these tournaments. Um, and then we used competition models to test how well the different existing indices of, of uh, intransitivity explain coexistence. Um, we also examined the, the impact of loop position, which was part of the title earlier on. Um, part of the reason we expanded it is, is, will be clear because it doesn't seem to matter about that much. So we were kind of interested. Th this would be an example of of uh, loop position in an other erstwhile hierarchy. Now, the reason we were originally interested in this is because uh, the literature previously, until maybe you know, three or four years ago, suggested that uh, intransitivity could be fairly rare within natural systems. But of course, there's a lot of limitations, and we knew this um, in terms of the way that we assess intransitivity um, that may be opening up the possibilities of, uh, of uh, or possible methods out there for determining intransitivity for a larger population of species are expanding, which 
makes these kinds of explorations of, of detailed aspects of, of competitive topology more relevant now. So this would be an example of where the, uh, the, in, the intransitive loop occurs at different points in an otherwise hierarchy. Right? So our simulations, and I'm going to just uh, briefly highlight them because uh, ultimately the, the outcomes of them, uh, anybody who has questions can ask later about the details, but um, just the results are, are more relevant. So we looked at three to nine species, uh, all possible tournaments, um, and a sample for nine, that's about 17,410 tournament runs. Uh, the world size that we used for the spatial models was 200 uh, by 200 and the competition uh, essentially took place um, in a focal individual was chosen, a second focal individual was chosen from uh, the four uh, sort of perfectly adjacent uh, squares in the, or, or cells in the, in the world, um, and then basically uh, following the competition rules, replacement occurred. Okay, so the dominant would replace the subordinate, right? Uh, each generation or generation was uh, 40,000 uh, competition events, on average one per, per cell. And uh, the duration was 10 to the six generations or until we reached a monoculture. All right, so that's just a summary here. Um, and you can see at the end we also um, looked at a 20 species system with a loop at each uh, point along that other, otherwise hierarchical system, so for a total of 18 samples, just to consider that. All right, uh, some of the indices we have, Slater's I, um, which uh, is, a, is, is basically the num minimum number of reversals to convert a tournament to a hierarchy. So if you take a look at this, one reversal uh, is required to, to return this, uh, this competition tournament to a hierarchy. Uh, this is a, um, sometimes scaled by the maximum number of, of reversals uh, needed, and, and it's uh, a different index uh, that, that's uh, called the Petritus Index. Um, another one, Kendall and Babington Smith's D is the num essentially the number of intransitive uh, triads, and you can see uh, here the number of uh, uh, triads are all illustrated, and some of them are intransitive and some of them are not, uh, and you can simply count that. Um, this is also uh, uh, an unscaled version of uh, Rob's and I early, early metric, uh, which is the relative intransitivity metric, and we only discovered later uh, that while they ca are calculated differently, it's exactly the same as our own. All right, uh, Besenbinder's rho and delta, delta prime, I mean, uh, are, are uh, from the uh, sort of different end of the literature, but also effectively two measures of the distance of a matrix or, or a tournament from a hierarchy. All right, uh, you can do this. These two are, are very closely correlated as well. We're a little less familiar uh, with those, but essentially one is the number of edges in, involved in uh, the intransitive relationship, and one is the rank of the cycle matrix, which is, again, a distance from, from a hierarchy. All right, and then we included two binary uh, uh, S, uh, indices. Are, is there an unbeatable species? If, uh, if there is not an unbeatable species, you, you're likely to end up with at least three species left. Is there an always beatable, are there any always beatable species? Because if there are, they're going to disappear very quickly, right? So the tournament uh, uh, outcomes looked a little bit like this. Um, essentially, uh, as I said, they're spatial, all right? There's, there's certainly uh, abundance fluctuations within that realm, but uh, over many generations, uh, and, the, and here, um, coexistence of, of these individuals lasted uh, millions of generations in the spatial version. This is sort of an illustration of, of the spatial world, and you can see essentially the, the clustering that is responsible for coexistence in that, uh, in, in, in a less spatial version uh, coexistence, uh, uh, you end up with one species quite, quite quickly. We did those as well. So the results, uh, and I'm just gonna give you a sample for the eight species one, because it's easy to look at, is you can see that uh, both the first two um, reflect fairly strongly coexistence, and the other measures and uh, do so in a more binary fashion. Uh, it is worth noting as well, though, that they are not, they are not uh, capturing all aspects of uh, coexistence. There's more complications uh, related to uh, coexistence. This would be a basic summary of it, which illustrates uh, that uh, Kendall and Babington Smith's measure uh, is probably the best in terms of predicting coexistence, at least in this model, which made us feel good since ours is an analog of, our, our metric is an analog of that uh, previously existing one as well. 
All right, and so you can see that, that each of them are capturing some aspect of it, but none ultimately capturing everything, although um, Kendall and Babington Smith is capturing a fair bit. All right, uh, runs, uh, I mentioned loop position. Loop position did not seem to matter unless uh, the intransitive triad was lo uh, included the dominant uh, uh, three species, essentially, because they, they function as a single unit. Um, outside, and that, that's basically similar to the, the binary uh, estimate of whether there is indeed one dominant, uh, truly dominant species or not. All right, so in conclusion, simulation tournaments uh, show that the number of intransitive triads in a tournament is the dominant predictor of, uh, of variance and coexistence. Uh, aspatial of, of, of versions of these models produced an analogous uh, set of results. And loop position doesn't really matter, except when the, the, the most dominant species uh, is included uh, in, in uh, an intransitive loop. And that's it. Thank you. Thanks, Eric, and welcome, everyone. Well, I guess the rock paper is, uh, graph is already familiar. And actually, that's a reminder of an, an, an acknowledgement of, of, of my appreciation of the work that you guys did, and also Stefano and John, because that's the, the work that actually inspired what I'm going to present today. So thanks very much, and thanks for coming, by the way. And I promise they won't be equations. I'm just an empirical ecologist. I'm not a modeler. So I get lost with these homongous equations. So I just decided to test experimentally uh, what these guys have been doing over the years. So that's a graph of one of the papers that inspired me in the world of intransitivity, and is by Robert and Brandon. And well, what they show here is pretty much uh, a results of a simulation. You have been tons, you have seen tons of that by now, probably. So I'm not going to go over that, but. Yeah, it's basically when competition turns to, uh, turns to fully hierarchical, to an intransitive competition, you get more species. And that actually wasn't just a model result. Uh, oh, oh. In 1996, uh, Siner One Lively showed that with anolis lizards. Then uh, Kerr et al. in 2012 showed it with bacteria. And one of my favorite words that I think has been forgotten, and uh, that's very unfair, is that of Jeff Bush in 1980. Uh, with barnacles, which is actually an experimental, uh, an experimental result in, in real communities. Uh, but the general feeling of that is like studies are normally limited to three species, and they are normally on computer models or very particular uh, communities. So we wanted, as everyone of, that has been working here before, we wanted to know the generality of how general or how frequent is intransitive competition in nature. So first, we realized it was impossible to measure that in the field, so we first developed a method together with Werner Ulrich that was published in OICOS in 2014, in case you are interested. And then we applied this method to two databases. One is uh, 1,500 German grasslands, which is the graph in the top. And then the second one was, was 224 uh, dryland communities all over the world. And we measured the intransitive metric, and that's a heads up. Uh, we measured the intransitive uh, metric between the dominant species due to the limitation in the replication level of our study. And we saw that actually uh, it correlates the more intransitive 
uh, competition you get, the higher the species richness you found. Obviously, these are observational studies. You cannot really conclude that that's a, a, a causal linkage, but definitely is something there to keep uh, looking for. And the other interesting thing that I think nobody predicted because there is such a lack of empirical data is that uh, that other graph uh, that shows the intransitivity metric and how it changed uh, according to the number of species you include in the, in the metric, right? So we found that uh, for the five dominant species, and these species are, are ranked according to their dominance or their abundance. So we, we could see that for the abundant, the five abundant species, uh, actually the intransitive uh, level is pretty high, but that level declines brutally when you include more and more species. So that leads at, uh, us to an hypothesis which we call the nested net hypothesis that is basically like intransitive competition will be more common between the dominant species than between dominant and rare species. And we decided that it was a, a limitation in the current literature because uh, we have these observational patterns and we have these models and we have these little tiny experimental studies, but we didn't have a common methodology applied to several taxa to really uh, understand how common intransitive competition is. And, and we didn't have like multiple complex uh, systems that we could test. So the aims of this talk are basically to test how common are intransitive competition networks in nature or natural uh, communities, what are the drivers of intransitive competition networks, and how does intransitive competition relate to biodiversity. Uh, heads up is that these results are fairly, fairly um, uh, preliminary, so don't totally trust them, and some things are, I'm just working on now. So it's just to show up a little bit uh, what we are doing, but is not uh, totally final results. So the methodology, that's clear. <laughs> that's the only thing is clear. Uh, we first designed the pairwise competition experiments, and from that, as you have seen a ton of times, I, I, another thing that I'm going to show is one of these uh, loops with the balls, because I, I knew you will see several of those. So we designed the pairwise competition experiments, and from that we can measure intransitivity. And then uh, we calculated the probability of each species of, our, of participating in one of these intransitive loops, and we will relate that to the functional traits. That's work that we haven't done yet. But also, uh, we will relate that to, inclu uh, to include the dominance, which uh, is to test this nestedness hypothesis. Then we actually, because we knew the level of intransitivity of different species combinations, uh, we, we could assemble experimental communities that we knew they differ in the degree of intransitivity, and we did that for three, five, and seven species. And because normally the mechanisms, uh, and Lore was uh, showing potential mechanisms that can lead to intransitive competition, one of them is allelopathic compounds, actually. So we decided to have a knockout treatment with activated carbon to kidnap these allelopathic compounds and see what happened. And then we did measure uh, diversity, different metrics of diversity and coexistence at the end of the experiment. And we did that for five taxa. So aquatic proteins, vascular plants, saprophytic fungi, bryophytes, and soil bacteria. Obviously, I didn't do that all by myself. So there is the list of collaborators there. And really, I appreciate and thank them. Uh, OK, some results. So the first question was, how common are intransitive competition networks in nature? Uh, the box plots show what we found in the field, applying our method. So the first result I'm happy to show here is actually, it seems that the observational method we develop fits very well with the, the little dashes, which is what we found experimentally with pairwise competitions. Uh, so we can see that for plants, mosses, uh, fungi, and protists, uh, the intransitive levels are pretty high, much higher than the fully hierarchical competition. So that seems to suggest that it's fairly general. And then you see a plus F. One of the treatments we applied, it was a fertilization experiment. In the case of bacteria, it was just a fertile soil versus an unfertile soil. And in the case of mosses, it was a fertile, or actually adding nitrogen or, no, or not adding nitrogen. And what are the results here? That's pretty much it. Like, uh, you can see that in the bacteria, the levels of intransitivity are very low. In the plants and the proteins tend to be really high, and the mosses and fungi are somewhere in the middle. Then we wanted to know the drivers of, of competition. The first bit is the environmental drivers. The previous work has suggested that more heterogeneous environments and more productive environments can lead to intransitive competition. And we saw that for these German grasslands. In here, we have land use intensity. That's an SEM. No worry about the details. 
but basically uh, land use intensity, mainly fertilization, which homogenize uh, ecosystems, reducing transitivity, and that has an indirect effect on species richness, which is obviously smaller than the, the other effect. And then we saw in the field with mosses that uh, intransitivity was related to productivity, which is somehow counterintuitive to what I just showed, uh, that fertilization declined the level of intransitivity, and that's because it does increase uh, the amount of invaders, but it does decrease the, the target biomass or the biomass of the target species that are competing in an intransitive loop. Uh, the other main result, and I will be more or less quick here, uh, we wanted to test this nestnet hypothesis, basically summarized in this matrix, and our, our thought does, uh, was that uh, intransitive competition should be more uh, frequent or, or stronger between dominant species or between rare species, but not between these two groups. That's more or less show there. And we actually tested that with our pairwise competition experiment. We calculated the, the, the level of intransitivity, which is the, the x-axis in these uh, histograms of the common species which are in red and the rare species which are in blue. Common and rare means uh, field abundances, so it's totally independent data. And we, um, with saprophytic fungi, it was actually the hierarchy, like the, the order of the, of the species in the matrix, meaning that competitive superior are above and competitive inferior are below. And we found more or less a uh, general pattern that uh, intransitive competition is stronger or much frequent in either abundant species or species that rank higher in the in the competition except the case of fungi which actually has a ham shape that I cannot really explain right now um, more results is uh, what we what I showed for plants at the beginning it turned out to also accomplish for mosses we did a field uh, observation and we relate the intransitive level to uh, species regions of mosses, and the relationship was even better than with plants. But that still is high intransitivity correlates with high species richness. So we related that to our manipulative experiment, and we saw that actually the, the level of intransitivity we obtained from pairwise competition, it does uh, relate positively to effective species richness, which, which is related to the evenness of the community. And talking about replicability, we actually repeated the, the whole fucking thing one year after the other, and the results are fairly consistent. That's 2014 plantation, 2015 plantation. And actually, I just cherry picked these results because we're the nicest one, but the nature is complicated, much more complicated than models sometimes. So we found that high intransitivity drive or, or promotes high species reasons, but not always. So we did that. I didn't have time to analyze the bacteria uh, yet, but basically for most fungi plants in 2014 and 2015, in 15, you can see uh, three metrics of coexistence that we analyzed, the number of species that went uh, extinct, the effective species richness, and the number of colonizers that came to the, to the experiments, which in fungi was none, obviously, because it's a petri dish experiment. And you can see in, in green shade uh, what was more or less favoring our a priori uh, thoughts that intransitivity will increase somehow uh, species coexistence. And the T is the treatment, this activated carbon treatment. We also added insecticide in the case of plants. And you can see that in many cases, uh, intransitivity does lead to a higher coexistence, but that's not always the case. In the case of moss, is nothing significant. That's actually because we are not taxonomists of moss, and the taxonomer was busy when we planted them, so I think it was some confusion with the species. That's one of the reasons I told you it's a priori result, so don't take that into account, please. And another funny thing is actually I was expecting uh, three species in transitivity to have much stronger or much, uh, much positive results according to, to prior theory, as we were showing in all the models, but actually it turned out that five species and even seven species were more um, normally uh, linked to higher intransitivity leading to higher coexistence. So to quickly conclude, intransitive competition seems to be the norm, not the exception. Uh, competitive or abundant species seems more likely to be involved in intransitive loops. Those factors that reduce environmental heterogeneity or decrease productivity are likely to damper intransitive competition and intransitive competition enhance species richness, but not always. And with that, I conclude. I'm happy to take questions. And thanks very much to all my collaborators. Otherwise, this work won't be possible. So thank you.
Yep. Yeah. But do you think this might be available somehow? Because, you know, maybe when you have the, the full main, the full addition symmetric, like you have the all possible interaction, but actually they are derived from single parallel. Yep. That's a very nice question. And that's one of the things we wanted to test is uh, whether or not these high order interactions matter. I actually reread one of the works of John, and he did that in the 69, but I didn't remember. So, yeah, but the idea is also whether or not these pairwise uh, interactions can really predict what will happen when you put all the species together. No idea. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. Yeah. Sorry to ask that. I'm very sorry to ask that. But do you think it's, it's that lot of knowledge in the set of pairwise niche differences is okay? Because, for instance, you see the result that the more environmental variability that you have, the, the higher the set of interactivity. Yeah. But also, because you have higher environmental variability, it's more likely that you have higher niche differentiation. Yep. So yeah, I, I totally agree with this question. And actually, uh, I, I thought you will remember that that we, we designed the, together with the pairwise competitions. We have this. We were, we went to Zurich to talk to John to Jonathan to see how we could live with that, and we have uh, this pairwise competition divided by inter, intraspecific, and mono individuals. So we hope, in collaboration with you, to test the niche and fitness differences and see how that could explain why or when intransitivity does lead to coexistence. What are the conditions that are required for that? and whether or not you require more niche and fitness differences with you, when you increase the number of species, which will be more related to what Lord is doing with the length of the loop also. So, yeah. Thanks for letting me Yeah, no problem. Well, thank you very much, and, and thanks to the organizers. I've, I've really enjoyed the symposium so far. Um, I, I also hoped to see, to see Jeff uh, talk today. So uh, the silver lining is for me that I get to talk. Whether that will be a, a silver lining for everyone else, I'm, I'm, uh, I can't guarantee that, to be honest. But I hope so. So a structure that we've been talking about this whole symposium so far is the tournament. And in the graph theoretical sense, a tournament is something like this. We've actually already seen this exact slide in an earlier talk. So in this case, the nodes represent species, and the arrows, which are directed edges, which are among all pairs of species, represent the outcome of competition among those species. So in this case, the edges are going to, com uh, to point from the direction of the subordinate to the competitive dominant. Um, and this can also be shown as a competitive outcomes matrix. So in this case, if the row species is the winner in, in asymmetric competition, then you're going to get a one at that position if the row species outcompetes the column species. And similarly, of course, if the column species is the winner, if it outcompetes the row species, then, then we have a zero in that position. And so these are going to be, in a sense, anti-symmetrical. If you fold them across the diagonal, the ones are in the position of zeros and the zeros are in the positions of ones. Now, with these tournaments, we can look at not just rock, paper, scissors, but of course, intermediate levels of intransitivity. So for example, on the left-hand side here, we have uh, a more hierarchical tournament, and in fact, a perfect hierarchy in this case. And in this case, com competitive outcomes can be listed as, as a, a list from most competitive, in this case at the top, with the most number of, of wins in, in competitive outcomes, all the way down to the least competitive in terms of the number of, of wins. So in this case, there's no loops or cycles in the graph, and, and it shows up in the matrix too, naturally, since they're, they're the same structure. 
and we have a totally nested pattern of, of which species beats which other species. And it's very easy to rank who outcompetes whom in this case. Now this goes all the way to the other side where we have more intransitive uh, systems. And in this case, it's really difficult to rank by who outcompetes whom because there are many loops in this case and you can't really form nested patterns. Now, we also have intermediate types of intransitivity. And so in this case, you have one that's quite close to a hierarchy. You can see it has quite nested patterns, but there is a loop involving the first three species in this case. So you have a tie effectively at the top of, of what's otherwise uh, a perfect hierarchical list. And so what you can see from this middle one is that if you were just able to reverse the competitive outcome between one of these pairs, you'd wind up with a hierarchy. And that's one of the ways that levels of, intr uh, comp levels of intransitive competition have been, have been indexed before. So for example, taking that intermediate one, if we were to reverse these two species, you'd get this matrix on the bottom, which as you can see, you get a hierarchy. If we reversed from species one and species three, and similarly, if we reverse species one and species two, or species two and, and species three, in all those cases, you convert a, an intransitive network into a perfect hierarchy. So all of those are, um, all of those show that there's exactly one reversal that has to be done in order to convert the network into a hierarchy. And so as I mentioned, this relates to an index known as Petritus's T, and I've actually shown uh, what I'm calling Petritus's T prime, since it's, it's a bit easier to follow, it's just one minus T. But this is going to equal uh, S divided by M, where S is the number of reversals, that is the minimum number of reversals that are required to change a given tournament into a hierarchy. And M just scales this so that it goes between zero and one. So M is the maximum possible number of reversals for an N species tournament. And in Petritus's original formulation, there was provided this way of calculating S. So this is done by looking at the number of times species I wins in pairwise contests. So in other words, the row sums of each species gives the number of wins in those tournaments. And RI gives the number of uh, expected wins by the species in a hierarchy. So this is just going to be a sequence from zero to n minus one. And so there's a very simple formula for that, as well as a very simple formula for m, the maximum such value. Now, earlier work of ours suggested that, that there might be something wrong here, because we occasionally found values of m, or values of t prime, rather, excuse me, that were greater than one. And that should be impossible, because m is supposed to be the maximum value of s. So clearly, if you get a value greater than one, there's, uh, there's something going wrong and, and uh, going off the rails. And so that's kind of what we wanted to, to look at in this case, was, was what's going on here? How do we get a value that's greater than 100% of its maximum value? And so what we took on this was, was a really a brute force approach. So rather than trying to, to have, a, to have a, a high finesse type of situation where you're going to calculate what the intransitivity will be, we were actually going to determine it by brute force by looking at all the non-isomorphic tournaments uh, for n species, uh, finding s by comparing them to all possible n factorial hierarchies, and then simply finding m as the maximum value of s across all of those of, of those uh, tournaments. So of course we have to start off with isomorphic tournaments, or we have to only look at isomorphic tournaments. If they're isomorphic with one another, then we really haven't got a new uh, type of tournament. So in this case, these two tournaments are isomorphic because they can be rearranged to one another by a simple rearrangement of row one and row five and, and column uh, one and column five. So these would only count as actually one tournament. So this is another slide that you've actually seen before, the number of tournaments uh, against the number of non-isomorphic tournaments. And this increases absolutely explosively with, with the size of the system. So for, for uh, three species, you only have two possibilities, rock, paper, scissors, or the hierarchical case. By the time you get to five, you have 12. And by the time you get to 17, you have 244 uh, gazillion. So, for an, for an example of this, when we actually did this, if you were to take this example tournament and calculate S based on the formula, you of course have uh, your 
A values, which are the actual realized numbers of wins, or the row sums. So in this case, all of the row sums are going to be three, so it's just seven threes. And R is equal to the row sums in a hierarchy. And so to calculate S, we would just have three plus two plus one plus zero plus one plus two plus three, which is 12. If you sum that up, divide it by two is six. And so this suggests that this should be uh, six reversals away from the nearest hierarchy. But when we looked at all n factorial tournaments, so all uh, 5,040 seven species hierarchies, we found that none of them were, were within less than seven reversals away. So clearly there's, there's a, a problem there. And also in terms of m, the, the maximum value, this was also uh, miscalculated in this case. So you can see that, that uh, Petraitis's method works for six or fewer species, but as you increase above that, it's an underestimate of the true maximum number of reversals that you can get away from a hierarchy. And when I say the maximum number of reversals, this is really a maximum minimum number of reversals that you can, can get to a hierarchy, just to, just to clarify. I don't know if that clarifies it, but just to, just to uh, <laughs> complexify that. Now, interestingly, in the entire graph theoretical literature, M is only known for up to 13 species, but lower bounds are known from the literature, and we can see that even with the lower bounds of these values, it's still uh, an, an underestimate using Petritus's method. And as we delved into the graph theory literature, which, which has actually worked on this quite a lot, we found that there's an even more fundamental problem with the calculation of S. So not only is their formula incorrect, but the goal of trying to find a formula is actually futile. Because S is what's known in, in computer science as an NP-hard problem, um, and it's equivalent to, to quite a fundamental problem in computer science known as the minimum arc set length problem. Um, in, in computational studies and, and computational graph theory. Uh, so this means no closed form solution is likely to exist. And uh, in fact, a friend of mine who's a computer scientist told me that if one did exist, then you could actually convert any NP-hard problem into this problem and solve all the NP-hard problems. And, and that, would be, that would be sort of like the, the most important discovery in computer science ever. So this no closed for form solution is likely to exist. I, I don't know why I hedged it. No closed form solution exists. Um, and the time it takes to solve uh, S grows explosively with N. So uh, you can calculate it, of course, but not by an equation. You have to use some sort of algorithmic approach. And using our algorithm, you can see the kind of problem that you're up against. So our algorithms, which were, which were done uh, in C++, calculated the uh, the minimum number of reversals, so S for 10 species took around one second. And by the time you get up to 14 species, so not that much difference, it took 10 hours. So if I started it in the, in the morning, it wouldn't even be done calculating it by the time, um, by the time I, I left that day. Um, maybe I should stay longer, but I don't know. But anyway, the next morning it was done. It took 10 hours, um, and you can see that it's growing, growing hugely. So what we also then worked on is the relative intransitivity index uh, as an alternative. So uh, going back, this is one thing that we, we wanted to, to sort of solve. Uh, so in this case, again, we have A, which are the row sums, the number of species that each species out competes in, in uh, hierarchies, where again, it's basically a, a sequence of, of integers and intransitive tournaments where they're closer together. And what you can see from this is that the variance, or the sum of squares, of the number of wins, or of the elements of A, is going to be much lower in an intransitive tournament compared to in a hierarchy. And so we exploited this by calculating the sum of squares of those row sums and scaling them by both the, the, the observed value, by both the minimum and the maximum possible value in order to, to come up with an, an index which we called relative intransitivity. And uh, we were quite pleased with this, and then we discovered that it had been already proposed uh, in 1940. So we were, we were only off by, by about, uh, well, I guess about 65 years when we, when we originally did this. Um, and, in, and in fact, this, when, we, when we discovered this linkage, we were really actually happy because 
One thing we didn't realize at the time was that relative intransitivity is actually the number of intransitive triads over the maximum possible number of intransitive triads in this system. And it turns out that both of those actually do have equations that, that calculate them correctly. So rather than uh, being an NP hard problem, this is a problem that actually does have a formula uh, which can be used to solve for it. So it's much, much more easy to, to calculate, especially as you get to higher species richness. And you can see that, in fact, these are actually quite highly correlated from one another. So these are all possible 456 seven-species tournaments showing relative intransitivity on the uh, vertical axis and Petritus T prime on the horizontal axis. And you can see from the rank correlation that they're very highly correlated with one another. So to summarize what I've talked about, uh, Petritus' T, uh, it is a useful and intuitive index if calculated correctly. Um, and it's currently, though, only applicable to species-poor uh, communities due to uh, computational complexity. And in particular, as I mentioned, the maximum such value is, is not known by anyone for more than 13 species tournaments. Relative intransitivity, which again is related to, to uh, Kendall and Babington Smith's index, um, is computationally simple. It's intuitively linked with intransitivity since it gives the proportion of intransitive triads, um, and it's highly correlated with, with Petritus' T as well. And uh, in fact, as you may have seen in, in one of the earlier uh, presentations, it actually seems to do a better job, possibly because it has a finer gradation in, in possible values of predicting species coexistence in, in simple models. Thanks very much. I used up all my time. Okay. Okay, so our final speaker of the session is John Vandeleer. And coupling and transitive loops to the spatial framework is how we can have spatial structure and motion coefficients on stable elements. Okay, thank you for thank you for inviting me. I'd like to tell you about some uh, and this is time for 15 minutes, by the way. I got, didn't get the message, it's supposed to be 10 minutes, so I'm going to have to talk really fast. <clears throat> so I'd like, to, I, I'd like to give you some personal observations that I've made and see what you think about them at the end. I work in coffee production in Mexico and Puerto Rico, and this is the kind of, uh, this is the kind of place that I work. You can see a coffee, a coffee bush right here, right there and the rest of the plantation is in the background. Now in that coffee bush, frequently what you can find, more or less frequently, you, you can find this pest species. This is the coffee, the green coffee scale, and you can see the adults here, the adults here, and those are the babies there. The babies get blown around so that they, get, they, they basically have a dispersal, dispersal rate in the plantation. Inevitably, what happens, they get found by this, uh, this uh, uh, actor, this is a parasitoid, parasitic wasp that attacks them so that what you find eventually is a uh, scale insect that's been attacked by a parasitic wasp and you can, you can clearly see it. So what you have here is you either have a coffee bush which is, uh, which is free of the, uh, the pest, there you have the pest there, and then you have the predator and the pest combination right there. Now this reminds me of an old uh, experiment. How many people know this experiment? Please raise your hand. Okay, everybody should know this experiment, in my opinion. It's a classic, it's a classic experiment by Huffaker in 1954. And what you have here, you have oranges, and the top, the top of the oranges have a fungus that grows on them, and there's a mite that eats the fungus, and then there's a mite that eats the mite. So it's a predator-prey system. If you look at a single orange, what you get is a result something like this. Uh, what you get, the, predator, the prey goes up, and then the predator goes up, et cetera. But what you can see here is in this graph, in this graph here, you have either nothing, just a plain old orange, or you have a prey, or you have a prey and predator combination. Uh, if you put all of them together, of course, then you sum the whole thing, you get something like this, you get these very nice oscillations that go uh, must more or less in perpetuity. And then if we go to the Lacta Volterra, simple Lacta Volterra uh, results, everybody knows these results, you can have either a, a, a non-existent system, or you can have a stable system, or you can have one of these unstable systems, and I'm going to be talking here today about this situation right here, where when you put it into space, either in the Huffaker example or the example of my coffee plantation, what you get is an empty site, uh, migration of the prey, so you get the prey alone, 
uh, migration of the predator so that you get prey predator together or you get and, and the feeding rate of the predator then t tells you that you get an empty site that comes from that. Everybody see what that is? Okay, that's an intransitive loop. Uh, this has been pointed out many times before. I'm not the very f first one to point it out. So what we have here in the example that I gave you earlier is basically an intransitive loop where we have the empty coffee bush, the scale insect, and the parasitoid scale insect combination. Okay. So we have this, and I did a, just set up a you know, regular, simple CA, uh, CA model on a 100 by 100 lattice and see what would happen with it. And if you look at the various parameters, this, the, the parameter, this is a parameter space study. So each point here, each point here is, uh, is the uh, predator, predator migration rate. This is the predator attack rate. And then each one of these graphs is a decreasing predator migration rate. And you can see the basic pattern here. It's not surprising at all. I don't think it's surprising at all. You have either the prey predator uh, over the whole lattice persisting over the, the, in perpetuity, or you have a, an empty lattice because the predator eats all of the prey and then goes extinct itself, or you have the predator can't right, quite keep up and it goes extinct and the prey uh, and the prey is all alone. And then the little bubbles here have different combinations because when you do it over, I did 100 trials for each one of these, and so get the proportion that winds up with each one of these possibilities here. So this is actually, if you look at this, uh, if you stare at this for a while, maybe it's not obvious to you, but if you stare at it for a while, there's nothing really surprising about this, okay? Now, <clears throat> going back to the observations in nature, in addition to the parasitoid on the scale insect, what you have is a predator on the scale insect too. Here are the scale insects again. This is the coccinellid beetle. It's adult and it's larval form that prey on it. So what we have here, pretty obviously, is we have a two-species system. Now, in the spirit of MacArthur, I'm trying to understand how competition happens, but now I'm trying to understand how competition happens when competition is in the form of what is, to me, very obviously, two interdependent, intransitive loops, where we have an empty coffee bush, and then the scale insect comes here, and then either predator one or predator two will eventually find it. Now, <clears throat> anybody familiar with the intransitive with the intransitive loop literature knows what's going to happen here, okay, because the setup is basically the same as the setup that in this wonderful paper by Freyan and Abraham, where we have the Roxas's paper and the survival of the weakest, what we have is not exactly the same setup, but it, well, pretty much is the same setup. And what you get here is the gray and the black are two different genotypes. One is a good competitor, the other is a poor competitor. And the point here is when you set it up this way, why this is the good competitor and this is the poor competitor. The point is the poor competitor persists because of the intransitivity of the whole, the whole structure. Well, that's basically what we have when we have this system right here. We can have, uh, these are the two, ex two extreme examples, just uh, changing the attack rate of, of the predator, where we have a low attack rate of the predator two, or we have a high attack rate of the predator two, and we can, we can uh, either have the predator two persist, or we can have the predator one persist, and one can manipulate this very, fairly clearly. And then what you would predict when you put them together uh, is that, uh, well, basically you predict what actually does happen, that you get either this or this. Um, my friends tell me that, my, my friends told me when I first started doing this, well, if you just manipulate the dispersal rates and the attack rate, why, that should be able to stabilize the whole thing because everybody's fond of the whole competition dispersal trade-off thing, you know, and so that should, that should, really, okay, that should, uh, <clears throat> so that, uh, you, you should be able to manipulate this. Uh, possibly this is model dependent, I'm not really sure, it's a very simple uh, cellular automata model, but, uh, um, it, for, for all practical purposes, I think you can find knife edge, knife edges, uh, parameter values where you can get them to coexist, but probably not very easily. But, which brings me to, the, to, the, to my final point, really, and then go by, going back to the coffee plantation, uh, this is another system in the coffee plantation. This is what the coffee plantation more or less looks like. These are coffee trees down here. These are shade trees that shade the coffee plantation. Traditional way of producing coffee in Latin America, at least, is with shade trees above the coffee. What exists inside of the shade trees are these ants. There's nests, these ants, ants nest inside of the shade trees that are above the coffee. And these ants are mutualistically associated with those very same scale insects. Now, what's important here is that the ants <clears throat> in the shade trees, they are attacked by, and you can see them being attacked right here, by that creature right there. That's a fly parasite. And so what we have here is another uh, system where we have an empty 
empty coffee bush, which is the Azteca and the sail. And Azteca is the name of the ant. Far, pardon me, I didn't tell you that. Azteca is the name of the ant. And it, it along with its scale insect, forms the prey system that's there. And then the forehead, that P is supposed to be down here, then the forehead uh, attacks the Azteca, leading to this other intransitive loop. And we conceived of this thing as a sort of a Turing-type phenomenon with those diffusion equations, reaction diffusion equations, but I really don't like partial differential equations. So <clears throat> we did this in a, in, a, in, in a simple cellular automata model, mimicking the, uh, the, the, the diffusion equations. And these are field observations. This is a 45 hectare plot, and each gray dot here is a shade tree. Each black dot is an, a shade tree that contains one of those ant nests, and here for two different years. And then from the CA model, we get something that's qualitative, fairly, qualitatively fairly sim similar. And uh, anticipating what I'm going to say in just a moment, uh, when, we, uh, when we, we look at this from the point of view of the distribution of cluster sizes of the clusters that are formed in this system, we get a fairly, uh, fairly good uh, representation by, uh, with a power function. So this, <clears throat> what happens now when we put the system of two predators on a prey in a system that is spatially structured like this. And so all I really did was I took the underlying structure of the CA model and I made it clustered. So I had clusters of places where the things could operate. And when you do that, uh, why well, fairly obviously what happens if you then impose on this the, the, uh, the dispersion competition trade-off kind of thing, why well, then in fact you get the uh, stabilization of the system. So, what we have here is we have this system, this intransitive loop here, which creates a spatial structure uh, which allows this one to coexist. Now, if we look at the three, the three intransitive loops all fit together and just do a, a, a very simple model on that, while well, we get a structure like this. this is 500 by 500 lattice, and you can see the, what's, what's happening here. The blue, either the closed blue or the open blue, represent the Azteca, the forehead system, the ant and the forehead parasite system, and then the scale insect alone is in the green, and then the scale insect with the beetle is in the black, and then the, with the parasitoid is, the parasitoid is in the red, and you can see if you can see, maybe you can't see very clearly on this graph, but you should be able to. All the red ones, that is the parasitoids, are isolated around in, uh, uh, where, the, where they're near to where the green patches are, and all the beetles, the black ones, are concentrated together like here, like, like this. And if you look at this over time, this is the way it goes over time, the system stabilizes pretty nicely. This is a, a smaller lattice because, so that you can see the process a little bit better here. You see the black, the beetle ones are all connected together here. The red uh, parasitoids are, are separate from it. So what we have here is I would argue that we have this system, though it's unstable inherently, is able to be stabilized by the, by the, the spatial structure created by the other intransitive system. And when we're taking advantage of, taking advantage of this, the, um, the, the power function we have here, if you look at the system uh, that we have in, in, in the coffee plantation, you can judge the availability of sites where the intransitive loops could operate by the shade trees that do not have the ant nests in them. And this is the power function distributions at various critical distances among those shade trees. And as you can see, uh, it's, a, it's a good fit to the power function. And then you begin to get deviations up here as you have a, a higher critical distance. So the ultimate conclusion here is that we have this system as a whole, which creates a spatial structure which is reflected in this power function graph. And we have these two possibilities here where this uh, large patches down here, these are the excessively large patches in the system, they favor predator one, these are the small patches that favor predator two. So this system as a whole then is basically an interconnected or a coupled three, three intransitive loops coupled together where <clears throat> one intransitive loop creates the physical spatial structure which allows the other two coupled intransitive loops to coexist. Thank you.
that it depends on the type of interaction. Uh, a given biotic interaction can lead to a stable, uh, a stable communities or less stable communities. And predator prey, which is one of the things that you have here, might lead to a stable, uh, a stable community where there's a competition between predators, for example, could be a uh, destabilizing force habitat. Uh, the relative effect of that in your cycle, uh, the relative effect of different types of interaction. Well, yeah, from the, from the very first result that I showed you with the first intransitive loop, well, you can, de depending on the parameters, well, you can get anything you want. You can get any of the three, out any of the three outcomes, and, and then in between the areas of the parameter space where you have those particular three outcomes, you get that it's, it's, it, there's a, it's probabilistic also. With the overall system, the thing, same thing is true. Uh, it's not necessarily stable or unstable. It does depend on the parameter settings, no question about it. Any other questions? Usually, there's at least one question about coffee, but that's all right. <laughs> <laughs> that was going to ask me if you just, when you produce this in pest control, is it, can you actually apply this in a model to, to predict how to manage the crop? Um, well, I, I, I would say <clears throat> it, it's really very difficult to say for sure, but this particular coffee pest is not really much of a pest. And the reason it's not much of a pest is because this system exists. And I would argue that when farmers are concerned about controlling pests, why one of this is a beautiful example where the pest is not a pest because there's a, a fairly complicated biological system involved in keeping that pest under control. If you eliminated the ants from the system, for example, then it would become a pest, as it does in places where there are no ants. That we, we happen to know that. So the system as a whole, we think, um, sort of combines together to control that pest. And I, and, and well, we've argued in a, a book that we just recently wrote that that happens really a lot in, in agriculture. <coughs> yes? Yes, it most definitely does. Thanks for the question. Uh, that, the pattern comes from two different things, actually. The pattern of non-occupied trees, which is what's important here. The pattern of non-occupied trees comes from the way the farmer has actually planted the trees partially, but then also comes from the pattern of the ants attacking the trees. And the ants do occur in these, these clusters of trees because they're always occupying new trees, but then eventually the forward flies find them and sort of eliminate the entire cluster, which creates an opening for the beetles and the, and the uh, parasitoids to come in.